now opens. Suddenly you are free to choose your destination. Unlikely as it seems, you are all fly. No boundaries in sight. We'll soar and with the light, we will dance, we will sing. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I just want to give uh, compliments to the Ohana Arts Youth Performance of Peace on Your Wings. Uh, that is an original musical uh, with music by Jenny Taira and lyrics by Laurie Rubin, uh, based on the true story of a 12-year-old Hiroshima atomic bomb victim, Sadako Sasaki, uh, and her thousand paper cranes, uh, which became symbols of international global youth peace movement in the memory of the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and in honor of Sadako Sasaki, the Ohana Arts current and previous all youth cast of the Peace on Your Wings youth joined together from their homes around the country to offer this message of peace for the world. So thank you so much for to them and thank you um, so much to for us for joining us today. I just want to welcome you to our beginning end of our bomb talk story series. Uh, my name is Jose Barzola from the Matsunaga Institute for Peace at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. 
Our talk story today will focus on nurturing peace builders uh, with Hiromi Peterson and Naomi Hirano Omiso. Uh, thank you for joining us today to learn about resiliency during unprecedented times. Uh, Hiromi Peterson and Naomi Hirano Omiso are retired educators from Kunaho School that will share their respective families' wartime experiences that set in motion their eventual journey together to reach beyond their Japanese teaching careers. They are co-authors of a successful secondary high school Japanese textbook series, Adventures in Japanese, that is widely used throughout the United States, Japan, and Europe. The proceeds of the textbook have been used to pursue their dreams of nurturing youth in Hawaii to become global peace builders. Uh, let's start today's event by introducing our guests. Uh, first off, Yomi Peterson is originally from Hiroshima, Japan. Uh, she's a Hibakusha Nisei, which means parents or immediate family members are atomic bomb victims. Uh, Hiromi has resided in Honolulu for 48 years, married to Dr. Wes Peterson, who is deceased and has two children, Junko and Ken. He taught at Mary Knoll High School in 1980 to 1984 and taught at Punahou School for 30 years, so 1984 to 2014. Hiromi is the co-author of Adventures in Japanese textbook series and calligraphy instructor of Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii. She's a recipient of the National Council of Japanese Language Teachers. Teacher of the Year Award, Hawaii Association of Teachers and Japanese Teacher of the Year Award, and Tanimoto Kiyoshi Peace Award. Naomi Hirano Miso, uh, who's also joining us today, is originally from the Big Island, Hawaii. Uh, she's third generation Japanese American, Niki Sansei, descendant of immigrants from Shizuoka in Hiroshima, Japan. Naomi resides in Kailua with husband Stanley and daughters Lee. She taught at Mid Pacific Institute from 1980 to 1988 taught at Punahou School for 1988 to 2020 and co-authored Adventures in Japanese textbook series. Naomi is a recipient of the Crown Prince Akihito Scholarship and the Hawaii Association of Teachers of Japanese Teacher of the Year Award. I am very humbled and honored to have both of you with us today and to be able to share your story with us. So to get us started, I'm going to turn it over to Hiromi Peterson. And let me get things are you ready? And you know me, are you with us? <laughs> uh, let me unmute you. I'm gonna so people can see you and there we yeah. go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. You're on, you know me. Let me send it over. Yep. Start? Okay. There we go. Hi. Hi, I am uh, Hiromi Peterson, a uh, Hibaku Nise, a second generation of the atomic bomb victim in Hiroshima. All of my family are uh, Hibakusha, atomic bomb victims, except me. I'm the only child in my family who was born after World War II. My father was uh, drafted in Hiroshima and sent to China as a soldier. During the battle, he got injured and was sent back to Hiroshima and experienced atomic bomb. At uh, 8.15 a.m. on August 6, 1945, when the atomic bomb was dropped, my family was in Hiroshima. The house was close to the hypo center, but uh, they were protected by a small hill called Hijiyama. My mother was uh, feeding my older brother, who was just three months old, and my older sister was uh, five years old and playing in a room by a glass window. And my second older sister was three years old and playing in the middle of the room. My father already left home for his work and was sitting on the chair under the tent of his rice shop near the house. Right after the enormous bright flash, the atomic bomb exploded above the citizens of Hiroshima City. The roof crashed down over my family. My mother tried her best to take all the glass pieces stuck on my older sister's skin. 
and prepared to evacuate. Then my father came home with the severe burns on the right side of his body. My mother put my father on the cart and pushed it with my two older sisters and the baby on her back and evacuated from the city because a big fire was approaching them. They headed away from the city. Later, my mother talked about the, what she saw at that time, that it was hell. So many dead bodies, so many people with burns and injuries. So many people were walking with the burnt skin hanging. And some people's eyeballs were hanging. Lots of people were begging for water to drink. But soon after they sipped water, they died. Lots of people jumped into the river and died. The rivers were full of dead people. My family evacuated to a school gym outside of Hiroshima City and laid my father on the floor along with so many injured people. However, one by one died. The gym floor was full of fly maggots. One small rice ball per person was not enough and no medicine. My mother decided to go home to pick up something to eat and oil and took my oldest sister with her. For my father's burnt skin, my mother applied oil and the ashes from the dead bodies burned in the school playground big hall. When he got better, my family returned home. Many years later, my mother and my oldest sister who returned home to the city several times died from leukemia. My mother died at the age of 78 and my older sister was 62. My older brother died from a blood disease affecting the immune system at age 72. And my second older sister is now 77 and is still suffering from the same disease. All of these diseases were caused by radiation. One atomic bomb on Hiroshima killed about 200,000 innocent citizens, including some American prisoners of war and Korean forced labor workers. So years later, when I told my parents about my plans to marry American, they disowned me. And my grandmother, who I was very close to, refused to meet my American husband. My grandmother lost her husband from the atomic bomb within a week. My husband was also 24 years older than me divorced, had three children. There were enough reasons for my parents and my grandmother to refuse my husband. But the biggest reason must have been that they experienced the cruel war with Americans as the enemies. My husband was the same age as a Senator Daniel Inoue and was enlisted during his college life at the University of Michigan. He was assigned to the Southern Italy Airport as an American military engineer. He experienced air attacks by German planes twice when his battleship was crossing the Atlantic Ocean. His duty was uh, fixing broken fighter aircraft and uh, uh, radar equipment, but he saw lots of dead soldiers. He had a deep respect for American 
uh, Japanese American soldiers who were fighting against the Germany in Northern Italy. When the war in Europe was over, he returned to a military base in Texas and heard that America dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. When he visited the Hiroshima Peace Museum for the first time, I still remember he was crying all the way and seems to have understood why my family was especially against his marriage to me. Eventually, with the arrival of my children, Junko and Ken, my family in Japan finally accepted my husband, Wes. Oh, Naomi, uh, you're still muted right now. Let me just... Uh... There you go. Hello, I am Naomi Hirano Omizo, a sensei, third generation Japanese American, born and raised about 20 miles from Hilo on the island of Hawaii. My maternal grandparents had roots in Hiroshima Prefecture. My grandparents on my father's side immigrated from Shizuoka, Japan. My paternal grandfather, Naojiro Hirano, arrived in Hawaii at the turn of the 20th century, following his older brother to work on the sugar plantations. He settled on the island of Hawaii um, at the Ola'a Sugar Plantation in Puna. Dissatisfied with plantation work, he and his brother did not renew their labor contracts and instead began working at the Parker Ranch in Kamuela. He later enrolled in English classes at the Hilo boarding school. He then returned to the plantations, but this time as an assistant manager at the Ola'a plantation store. An independent young man, Naojiro decided that it made better sense for him to operate his own business. He chose to build a store across the terminal train station of the line that ran along the Hamakua coast to Hilo to Glenwood. Visitors would disembark in Glenwood and take the horse and buggy carriage to Volcano, which was 10 miles away. Hirano's store opened on President's Day, 1918. Yes, the store is now 102 years old. Now Jiro and his wife, Shige, ran the store. They farmed and dabbled in various other business ventures as they raised their five children. The store became the hub of activity in the Glenwood community, where most of the residents were Issei, or first-generation Japanese immigrants. Naojiro enrolled in correspondence classes from Waseda University in Tokyo, as he opened a community Japanese language school for all of the school-aged Nisei children. My grandmother taught with him. He also served as a Japanese consular agent to assist his neighbors who were not American citizens and, just, and thus had to report annually to the Japanese government. He continued to operate his general store and served as principal of the small Japanese language school. Life was full for Naojiro and Shige. On December 7th, Naojiro and his son, my father Wataru, were up early on that Sunday morning. After breakfast, they left for work on their farm behind the store. Soon it began to rain, so they returned home. As they listened to the Japanese radio station, they were stunned to learn that Pearl Harbor was attacked by Japan. The news quickly spread through the community and soon the neighbors swarmed to the store to discuss their, con their concerns with Naojiro while their wives shopped to stock up. It was three o'clock p.m. by the time Naojiro finally sat to have his lunch. Soon after, a military police officer and local police officer marched through the store and barged into the kitchen. Mr. Hirano, we want to talk to you. Naojiro was escorted 
to a waiting black police car. There was no explanation as to where or why they were taking him or if he would ever be returning home. About a week later, my grandmother received a phone call telling her to pack a suitcase with warm clothing. My father drove her to the heavily guarded Kilauea military camp in Volcano. They were shown to a small room where my grandfather was held. Though reunited, they barely spoke as a military guard stood outside the open doorway with a rifle in his arms. They dared not speak in Japanese. As they parted, they had no idea whether they would ever see each other again. A few weeks later, Naojiro and several hundred others from the Big Island were transported to Sand Island, Oahu, where living conditions are said to have been oppressive. All of the Issei who were incarcerated were taken for no reason other than that they were than be, that they were Japanese leaders who could possibly rally other Japanese and resist. They were Buddhist and Shinto priests, Japanese language school principals and teachers, businessmen, Japanese newspaper editors, and those who were thought to be connected with the Japanese government. My grandfather fit the profile too well. Yet, throughout the war, there was not a single Japanese internee who was ever found to commit any act of disloyalty against the United States. In Hawaii, only slightly over a thousand Japanese were put in camps, unlike the West Coast, where Japanese experienced Join the meeting. incarceration. All Japanese from Hawaii were not interned as they were the mainstay of the economy in Hawaii at that time. Other reasons are also given for the partial internment. The swift internment of high profile community, community leaders was, a, was threat enough to their fellow compatriots to do their best to show their loyalty to the US. Naojiro left Hawaii for San Francisco aboard a ship crammed with other internees in conditions that were unbearable. There was a stench of urine and vomit. It was crowded, dark, and poorly ventilated. Remember, these were all well-respected, accomplished men in their prime and older. They were shifted from camp to camp across the United States, not knowing where their next destination would be. They were confined to desolate locations with severe winters, hot and dusty summers, with sandy windstorms, all while living in flimsy quarters. My grandfather spent most of his time in Fort Missoula, Montana, and Santa Fe, New Mexico. The internees were educated men, so they organized classes and taught each other courses, such as accounting, bookkeeping, and horticulture, while also entertaining themselves with sports, games, and music. Some wrote extensively and others engaged in artwork. They spent many hours in deep discussions, some of which were philosophical. Sometimes the discussions grew hot and divisive as some of the incarcerated still felt a deep connection to Japan, while others preferred to remain loyal to the United States. My grandfather belonged to the latter group. The internees corresponded with family and friends, but letters were often censored and portions were crossed out in black ink or they were cut out. Back home, the family continued the business without my grandfather. My 23-year-old dad, along with his mother and younger sisters, ran the store while he also farmed their land took up a carpentry job, and worked late at night harvesting hapu tree ferns. The family never knew if Naojiro would return home, but their courage, perseverance, hard work, and resilience served the family well. Naojiro rarely spoke of any of his negative camp experiences, though I am sure there were many. Surely he was humiliated as he was ordered to disrobe alongside his fellow inmate inmates. Surely he was questioned numerous times about his allegiance. Surely there were bayonets 
pointed at him. Surely he was sworn at and had derogatory names hurled at him by young American soldiers during those early years in camp. However, he would eventually share his, with his family only those light moments after he finally returned home in November of 1945. It is really a dark time in American history. Yet, Naojiro believed that those four years in camps were equivalent to a four-year college education. Indeed, he had learned a lot, not just in accounting and horticulture classes, but about life itself. Going to the U.S. mainland opened his eyes to its vastness and greatness, but it also sensitized him to America's vulnerabilities. He learned that even as a Japanese, he was equal to all others. He was proud to become a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1954, alongside my grandmother. In 1952, by the way, Asians were finally allowed to gain citizenship. Just a few months after Naojiro's return from the camps, my dad received a draft notice from the U.S. Army. Naojiro told his son, Wataru, go. America is your country. Serve it well. This story of my family is one I am proud to share. Some families fared better, but many fared worse. Naojiro lived the Japanese values of gamam, endurance, and gambari perseverance while adopting the American spirit of positivity and hope. My prayer is that no other family suffers as those who live through the many wars that mar our history. My family's experiences, Hiromi's family story, and the hundreds of war stories shared by my students have led me to my deep commitment to world peace and to deliver that message of peace to the younger generation. Over the course of my 40-year Japanese language teaching career, I came to believe that through strong communication skills and authentic cultural understanding across people of different races and cultures, we can work to achieve peace. Our job as educators is to successfully convey that message to our youth. With the personal hist uh, family backgrounds we brought with us, we will now share how we moved on in our professional careers. When I started to teach Japanese language at the Punahou School in 1984, the textbook we were using was a college level textbook and the topics were not interesting for high school students. For example, one conversation was between the company president and his wife. I thought I could write a better textbook for high school students, but I also knew that it's impossible to write it all by myself. Fortunately, Naomi joined me, and later more teachers joined us. The Adventures in Japanese, or AIJ, textbook series took 30 years to complete. It became the best-selling secondary level Japanese textbook in the US. The AIJ royalties totaled about $1.8 million, and we donated all of it to Punahou School and established the AIJ textbook endowment fund. We have been using this fund for our textbook project, language teaching material development, and the scholarship to send students to Japan. The topics were just uh, right for each student level. In level four, we chose topics about history, traditional culture, and values, and asked the students to think about a better way to live in a global society. One topic we decided to include was the wartime people's suffering. Naomi and I realized we have our own families who suffered during the World War II, 
So we decided to write our true stories. Writing this lesson opened my journey to discover my family's atomic bomb story. I also learned more about Sadako Sasaki and decided to include her story in Japanese. Sadako's story and her monument in Hiroshima are famous. <clears throat> Sadako was two years old when the atomic bomb was dropped. Ten years later, she was hospitalized with a leukemia because she was exposed to radiation. When she became ill, she started falling a thousand cranes so that she could uh, get well. She folded more than 1,000 cranes, but passed away. Her story became famous because she was a brave, compassionate young girl. Soon paper uh, cranes became a symbol of peace. Sadako's final wish was for all of us to live in a peaceful world. After learning about the family war stories of Peterson Sensei and myself in volume four of the textbook series and studying the story of Sadako Sasaki in Japanese, the students embarked on the culminating assignment of the unit. They each interviewed a family member who had lived through a war. When we first began this project, we learned about many World War II stories. More recently, we have received stories of the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and wars in the Middle East. Our students interviewed their grandparents in Russian, a little known dialect of Hindi, Mandarin Chinese, Cantonese, Korean, Tagalog, Visayan, Japanese, and of course, English. They have shared stories that were set in China, Taiwan, Japan, Russia, India, South Korea, Malaysia, the Philippines, Vietnam, the South Pacific, Peru, Germany, Italy, Afghanistan, Iraq, all over the continental United States, and of course, here in Hawaii. The depth and pain of the stories are indescribable. The details differ, but the students who write the reports in Japanese and English and present them to their classmates in Japanese soon realize that the essence of each of their stories is the same. War is suffering, war is painful, and war is cruel. We must all do our best to build a more peaceful, harmonious world. How does one achieve peace? Each student must come up with his or her, her own answer. Hiromi and I thought, how can we take this even a step further. Hiromi will share next. One year, I heard from a Punahou High School principal that the AIG Fund's annual interest earnings was $3,000. I thought that we should uh, spend this uh, interest for something meaningful. Naomi and I agreed we should send Punahou students to Hiroshima so they can see what really happened under the mushroom cloud. The principal approved our idea and we started the Hiroshima Peace Scholarship Program. We formed the Hiroshima Peace Scholarship Faculty Committee with, with uh, one social studies teacher and ourselves. We were lucky to find our partner school, Hiroshima Jogakuin, who accepted our students in their host families for about uh, 10 days and started the Peace Forum for high school students. It was 2009 when the uh, Punaho uh, uh, alumnus Barack Obama became president of the United States. Many Japanese media reporters and the Hiroshima Mayor Akiba visited Punahou School. Our scholarship program was off to a good start. 
The Hiroshima Peace Scholarship was thus established at Punahou School with our first scholars, Kevin Chan and Kayla Murata, both rising seniors who adventured to Hiroshima in the heat of the summer of 2009. They were accompanied by their faculty chaperone, Cheryl Matias, an English teacher. They folded a thousand crane garland to present to the Children's Peace Monument, better known as the Sadako Monument in the Hiroshima Peace Park. They participated in an exchange program at Hiroshima Jogakuin, our host school. They were welcomed into the homes of Jogakuin families, and to this day, the scholars maintain contact with their host families. While there, they visited other historic sites, met Hiroshima leaders, and did sightseeing. We continue to send two, occasionally three, Punahou students each year since. The scholars return to Punahou each year and share their experiences and the lessons they learned in Hiroshima at the high school chapels with an audience of more than 1,600 students and faculty members each year. Soon the message about Hiroshima became widely known at Punahou. And in recent years, the scholarship program has become very competitive. The second pair of scholars was Christina Meyer, second from left, and Elizabeth Ushigome, far right. Accompanied by Punahou chaplain, Lauren Medeiros, here you see them pictured at the Hiroshima Peace Park in front of the Memorial Cenotaph, which memorializes all of those who lost their lives as a result of the A-bomb. In front of the Cenotaph is carved the words, we will never repeat this mistake. Our third pair of scholars, HPS 2011, were Tamafukuyama Center and Nate Cox Wright. Their chaperone was Natalie Hayashi, second grade teacher at Punahou, where the social studies curriculum features Japan and island country. They are pictured in front of the iconic Hiroshima Peace Dome, an enduring reminder of the devastation Hiroshima suffered. Hiroshima Peace Scholars 2012 were Wright, Lin Takeshita, and Center Erin Nakashima, pictured here with their chaperone, Douglas Kiang's daughter. Doug was a computer science teacher at the Punahou Academy. The girls were honored to meet Mr. Clifton Truman Daniel, President Truman's grandson at Hiroshima Jogakuin. He even signed their peace banner for them. In 2013, we sent three peace scholars to Hiroshima. They led a group of fellow Punahou students to Japan during this year's pilgrimage to Hiroshima. We are pictured here at Pearl Harbor shortly after their return. Second from left is Jason Himeda, Jackie Kojima in the middle, and Darian Lau at the far right. Their chaperones were high school teachers Michael Georgi and Atsuko Madet. Peace Scholars 2014 were Christina Hill in the center and Stephanie Downing at the right. They are pictured here with their chaperone, Sharon Sikora, science teacher, in front of a photo of Hiroshima taken soon after the bombing. Shortly, you will be meeting Christina, who has agreed to join us today. Our 2015 Peace Scholars were Leo Kodesh and Tessa Scott. Their chaperone was Japanese language teacher Junko Eidi. In this photo, Leo and Tessa are participating in the anti-nuclear weapons signature campaign at the Hiroshima Peace Park. In 2016, Peace Scholars Anli Valdez, far left, and Julianne Kim, next to her, were at the Hiroshima Peace Park with their chaperone, Lin Suda, right. There, they met Mr. Masahiro Sasaki, the older brother of Sadako Sasaki. Our ninth group of Peace Scholars was again a threesome. They were Sydney Ahoy, left, Maika Nishimoto in the center, and Kevin Nguyen, right. Their chaperone was Trish Kelly, then a high school math teacher. They are preparing to present their garland of cranes to the Sadako Monument at the Peace Park. By the way, the logo you have been seeing on the slides 
is Sydney's artistic creation. Hiromi will introduce our two other peace initiatives next. In May 2012, Ms. Kazuko Minamoto from the New York Japan America Society visited us at the Punahou and asked us to help their fundraising campaign to exhibit one very small Sadako's paper crane to Pearl Harbor. Former Hiroshima Peace scholars, chaperone teachers, and the committee members gathered and decided to support this campaign. On International Peace Day, September 20th, in 2012, Mr. Yuji, <coughs> excuse me, Yuji Sasaki, Sadako's nephew, came from Tokyo to present Sadako's peace crane to Pearl Harbor. We had one year for fundraising until the unveiling ceremony. <coughs> when I heard that the Sadako's uh, crane will be exhibited at Pearl Harbor, I thought it's truly a miracle, and uh, even had tears in my eyes. Pearl Harbor was attacked by Japan, and the Sadako was a victim of the atomic bomb dropped by US. Until then, while Japanese said, no more Hiroshima, Americans said, remember Pearl Harbor. If you are the head of the Pearl Harbor Museum, would you welcome this exhibition? The Pearl Harbor Visitor Center did, and I was truly moved. Then how did this miracle happen? Mr. Masahiro Sasaki, Sadako's older brother, is a, a barber in Fukuoka. And Mr. Yuji Sasaki, Sadako's nephew, is a singer and the owner of the ramen shop in Tokyo. They had some of Sadako's paper cranes at home and felt they owed it to Sadako to do something with them. So they decided to donate one paper crane each to the war memorials on the five continents. They became peace builders. In 2010, when they donated the second Sadako's crane to uh, New York 9-11 Tribute Center, they met Mr. Christoph Truman Daniel, President Truman's grandson. President Truman ordered dropping the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yuji put a tiny Sadako's paper crane on Mr. Daniel's right palm and asked him if he could help to get it exhibited at Pearl Harbor. Before that time, Mr. Daniel happened to have a chance to read a book titled Sadako and the Thousand Paper Cranes, written by Eleanor Kaur, which is which his son brought back from school and left in the living room. He said, it was my first human story of the atomic bombing, and I was deeply moved. And he agreed to support the idea to bring the crane to Pearl Harbor. In order to make the Sadako's paper crane exhibit happened at Pearl Harbor. So many people in Hawaii community donated their time and money. We made Omoiyari donation card. Omoiyari means uh, compassion, which explains the value Sadako had. And the Punahou students talked about the Sadako story and asked for donation from family, relatives, and friends. They also talked about Sadako's story and taught how to fold the paper crane and asked for donations at the Okinawan Festival, 
Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii New Year's Festival and the Punahou Sustainability Fair. They raised $6,500. What made us happy was not just the amount of money the students raised, but each one of them has grown as a peace builder. On September 20th, 2013, International Peace Day, the unveiling ceremony of Sadako Screen was held at Pearl Harbor. This photo was taken before the ceremony inside of the Arizona Memorial by Ms. Kazuko Minamoto. Mr. Masahiro Sasaki, Sadako's older brother, and Mr. Loren Bruner, USS Arizona veteran and survivor, hugged each other. This tiny Sadako's crane at Pearl Harbor has truly become a symbol of peace and reconciliation. It is one of her last cranes. At the unveiling of Sadako's crane project at Pearl Harbor, students in the highest level of Japanese who had studied about Sadako volunteered at Pearl Harbor. It was to become the first of our Sadako projects. Here, our volunteer students share the story of Sadako and her message of peace and reconciliation to Pearl Harbor visitors while teaching them how to fold cranes. The visitors were reminded to see the Sadako visit, uh, exhibit and view Sadako's own crane. The visitors were reminded that uh, this was a very special exhibit. Since then, we have taken our advanced level student volunteers to Pearl Harbor one Saturday a month during the school year as part of the Sadako project. We have recently been joined occasionally by students from other schools and college students from the Matsunaga Institute for Peace. An offshoot of the original Sadako project is the Sadako Peace Crane Project. Kazuko Sakuma, an English teacher from Sophia University in Tokyo, learned of our Sadako project and began sending paper cranes made by her students with messages of peace written on their wings. Our volunteer students and our colleagues who serve as chaperones at Pearl Harbor distribute the cranes from Japan to visitors from throughout the world. This project has expanded to include cranes from many other schools in Japan. As of now, we have received more than 70,000 cranes from elementary through college age students and even some from senior citizens. Here you see some happy visitors with the messaged cranes. The cranes then fly off with them to every continent in the world. Our visitors learn the story of Sadako and share her message of peace and reconciliation in their respective hometowns. In 2013, several of our students created a bilingual brochure that we distribute at Pearl Harbor. It tells the Sadako story and its connection to Pearl Harbor. All who receive it are invited to send their handmade cranes to us so that they too can be shared with visitors at the Sadako Peace Crane Project. We are looking forward to starting up these projects soon again. We now segue to our most recent Hiroshima Peace Scholars. On the 10th anniversary of the Hiroshima Peace Scholar Program, we included two Peace Scholars from Farrington High School. We were pleased to finally fulfill our long time dream to include public school students. Here you see Punahou students, Megan Kobayashi left and Eden Chan, and to your right are Beiji Lam sitting and Ellery Ranido, far right, from Farrington High School. They are shown with their visual depictions of peace at a Kagehe shadow art display in Hiroshima. Their chaperones were 
Punahou middle, middle School teacher, Lisa Asakura, and Farrington High School teacher, Elizabeth Shiraki. Last summer, we sent three Peace Scholars to Hiroshima. There were Sierra Curator, far left, Ava Swazo Katen, right, and Ryan Kong, far right. Sierra and Ryan were Punahou students, and Ava in the center was from Wailua High School. Their chaperones were Taylor Wong from Punahou and Brittany Driggs from Wailua. They continued the tradition of taking their garland of cranes to the Sadaka Monument. Finally, we come to the Hiroshima Peace Scholars for 2020. They were selected at the end of 2019 and are currently seniors at Punahou School. They are from left to right, Ethan Gerhardt, Ryan Ueda, and Joshua Lee. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, however, they were not able to travel to Hiroshima this year. This summer, they instead invested their energies into creating virtual lessons for the Japan America Society of Hawaii. And we are hopeful that they will be able to participate in other peace related events through their senior year. We sincerely hope that they will someday in the future have the opportunity to visit Hiroshima. Now it is with great pride that we introduce you to Christina Hill, one of our Hiroshima Peace Scholars from 2014. She has kindly agreed to share her experiences before, during, and since her visit to Hiroshima as a Peace Scholar. Christina? Hello all. Thank you to Peterson Sensei and Omizo Sensei for allowing me to speak today on behalf of all former Hiroshima Peace Scholars. And thank you to the Matsunaga Institute for putting on this presentation. To say that my experience as a Hiroshima Peace Scholar was influential would be an understatement. My experience in Japan and the lessons learned have shaped my current career path. But to begin, I would like to discuss why I initially applied to this program. At Punahou, I was learning Japanese, and all that I knew about the country was from an Asian history class. However, I had heard previous Hiroshima Peace Scholars student students talk about their experiences and knew that this program seemed to transcend mere Japanese immersion. It was also intended to create cultural connections and promote nuclear non-proliferation at the high school level, something that is very rare and I hadn't been exposed to otherwise. Although I didn't know Japanese, I knew that I wanted to go to Hiroshima and bring back what I learned to Punahou and Hawaii. I applied and was elated when I was accepted. Thank you again to both Peterson Sensei and Omizo Sensei for giving me the opportunity. Although we only had 11 days in Hiroshima, I was thrilled to have made friends with my host siblings and the Jogakuen students. We realized how much we had in common. We were all teenagers worried about our next tests and normal high school drama and we all hoped one day to travel the world. While at the Jogakuen school, we shared Hawaiian culture while learning about the history and the reality of modern day Hiroshima. The relationships I made there are ones that I cherish to this day. What really was influential for me in Hiroshima, however, was the discussion of global nuclear non-proliferation. In Hiroshima, I saw how destructive nuclear weapons could be and why it was so important to ban them completely. This interest led me to apply to another opportunity at my undergraduate institution, Columbia University. I had heard about a new research group whose goal was to travel to the Marshall Islands in order to take measurements on nuclear radioactivity. The Marshall Islands are known to be the testing site of American atomic weapons during the Cold War. Although cleanup efforts were conducted by the American government, many of the islands are still uninhabitable and many Marshallese people are scared of even going near these islands. Our task was to collect ocean sediment, coconuts, and sand in order to test their radioactivity. It was eerie to see these beautiful and pristine islands that were made dangerous because of unseen radiation. The findings from that research trip were published in two articles in the National Academy of the Proceedings of Science. After I graduated Columbia, I knew that I wanted to travel and devote myself to studying international affairs and nuclear non-proliferation. I had studied Russian at Columbia, so I decided to apply to a one-year fellowship called Princeton in Asia. The fellowship allowed me to spend a year following graduation in Almaty, Kazakhstan, a former Soviet country that was the site of Soviet nuclear weapons testing. 
Much like the Marshall Islands, Kazakhs were told little about the Negro testing. Because of COVID, however, my fellowship was cut short and I had to leave the country. Thankfully, before I left, I was able to talk with locals about their opinions on the nuclear testing and current nuclear weapons use. I'm now back home in Hawaii quarantining with my family. I plan on beginning a master's program in international politics with University College London this fall, where I will focus on Russian studies and nuclear security. I hope to eventually work for the US State Department as a diplomat. I know that my global experiences from Hiroshima to the Marshall Islands to Kazakhstan have prepared me well for this career. Thank you for inviting me once again. Back to you, Amizo Sensei. Thank you, Christina. Your journey since you left Punahou is truly an amazing one. Our Hiroshima Peace Scholars are a true source of inspiration to us. We have stayed in touch with many of them. They have all taken different paths but we trust that their experiences in Hiroshima as peace scholars will continue to guide them and those around them to build a better, more harmonious and peaceful world for us all. Starting this year, we have decided to transition the Hiroshima Peace Scholarship Program and the Sadako projects at Pearl Harbor to the Japan America Society of Hawaii. We have left Punahou with a substantial endowment, and with the interest, Punahou has a yearly budget into which they can dip to support Japan-related activities for students. Most of our royalties from the textbook will now be donated to the Japan America Society. Other smaller gifts will be donated to organizations that promote Japanese culture in Hawaii. The JASH mission aligns perfectly with our goals. We are happy that with their well-developed educational programs and outreach into the community, they will be able to more effectively connect to other private and public school students who can also gain from the peace opportunities we have started. In our partnership with JASH, we are confident that we will continue to nurture young peace builders like Christina. In May 2016, President Obama visited Hiroshima and left a message with two paper planes he folded. His message reads, we have known the agony of war. Let us now find the courage together to spread peace and pursue a world without the nuclear weapons. Seventy-five years ago, World War II officially ended on the battleship Missouri with the Japan surrender. This occasion will be commemorated this year through November on the battleship. Many events of how 75 years have healed the Japan-US relationship are scheduled. It will highlight the reconciliation of the two countries. Here is one example. Sadako's crane and the President Obama's crane are displayed together at the exhibit on the Missouri. Let's celebrate this reconciliation. Let's join with President Obama and become peace builders. Yes, let's fulfill this dream together now. Before we sign off, we would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to Jose Barzola of the Matsunaga Institute of Peace, who has become a partner for our initiatives at Pearl Harbor in the past few years. We appreciate the opportunity he has given to us today to share our stories with you. We thank Christina as well. What a wonderful story. We thank all of, all of those who have supported us in so many different ways through our journey, from our early days, through our professional careers, through our textbook adventure, and through our efforts to nurture peace builders. 
our deepest gratitude to our families for their patience and support through all of this. Finally, thank you to our audience for attending today. Aloha and please be safe. May peace be with you. Hello again, everyone. Thank you so much. Arigato gozaimasu to Hiromi-san and Naomi-san for sharing your story today for us all to learn about your experience, um, your families, your journey. Uh, I'm truly just humbled by your journey to nurture peace builders and thankful for the opportunities that you both continue to provide future generations to learn about that fateful day 75 years ago. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to connect with you and learn about you your own resiliency and your family resiliency during those unprecedented times and just your continued just passion and to keep moving forward. And that's, that's I think, really one thing that I'm really taking away from today. And the story that provides really just a breath of fresh air of hope and vision to overcome challenges in our own lives. So I just, uh, arigato gozaimasu uh, for your time today. Uh, also a warm arigato gozaimasu to Christina for spending time with us today to share your story as a peace builder yourself. I, I know we all look forward to continuing to follow your career path and your journey as a peace builder and see where it leads us. So hopefully we'll have a, an opportunity to connect and learn further from you as time goes on. And last but not least, thank you to all for joining us today's webinar. We deeply appreciate your interest and support in joining us to learn about resiliency during unprecedented times through the beginning end of the Bomb Talk story series. Um, as I sign off though, I want to leave you all with one last special treat. This is from our very own Hiromi Peterson's calligraphy via her YouTube account, mm -hmm. Toka Shoto Calligraphy. This is something she's been kind of doing and busy while we've been having to stay at home. So definitely being productive. And uh, I will share this with you all and we will be signing off right after that. So thank you again all. And make up. Ha, ha, ha.